Welcome to this special episode of Movie Geeks United. Jan Sewell is in the business of transformation. As the BAFTA-nominated chief makeup and hair designer behind such films as Everest, Tomb Raider, The Danish Girl, The Theory of Everything, and the upcoming Wonder Woman 1984, she's crafted indelible looks that seamlessly complement character, performance, and narrative. She found perhaps her most daunting challenge in Bohemian Rhapsody, the rollicking story of the band Queen. Sewell was essential in transforming lead actor Rami Malek into rock god Freddie Mercury, but her work didn't stop there. She also had to work on crafting the aesthetic of Mercury's beloved bandmates and many thousands of extras who filled the film's overwhelmingly impressive concert scenes. We discussed these challenges and much more with Jan during a recent conversation. Enjoy. You know, I've admired your work over the years very much, and and I'm sure that you do a ton of research preparing for each project you take on, but the, the history of Queen is it, it's pretty well documented. I mean, they were front and center in popular culture for years and years. So I, I'm wondering what piece of research you found most instructive. Oh, well, first of all, thank you for the compliment. Um, um, yes, no, absolutely. I was, I was extremely aware that, the, although I liked uh, Queen, um, I wasn't a massive fan until after I'd worked on it and then I realised how uh, brilliant they were. But I also was aware that everybody, you know, there's so much about them. So I did watch uh, tons of concerts, um, uh, and and uh, how flamboyant Freddie was, and and, and also uh, there was quite a lot of research already that had been done by Aaron, um, our production designer, and Julian Day, because they were on board before me, um, and and so I I knew that that it was really important that we all worked really closely together because we had to make sure that that you know hair and costume matched, and 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 obviously the sets were all you know. Um, you know, it came through the early 70s all the way through. So so it was really important that we all work really closely together, which I love doing anyway. But um, I just watched so much stuff. And also, of course, Rami, who had known he was doing this part uh, for a while, came with such wonderful gems of little bits of information and, and the way uh, Freddie did this and did that. And um, there was so much that you could pull on, so much information. And with Rami, I mean, this is a this is a time vault performance. I think it's so it's so overwhelmingly good and, and accurate. Um, and I, I'm curious to know when you sat down with him to discuss the transformation, the the aesthetic transformation. What what went into that? Were, were there lots of lots of tests? Were there specific challenges involved? Um, yeah, no, there were, there were definitely, we did quite a few tests. Um, but the thing is, is when, when I, as soon as I knew I'd got it, I looked at uh, knew Rami was involved. I looked at pictures of Rami. Obviously, I had pictures of, of Freddie. Um, I also, one of my first phone calls was to uh, a gentleman called uh, Chris Lyons, who has a company called Fangs FX. And uh, he makes uh, lots of teeth and, and, and stuff for the film industry, and I work with him many times over the years and he'd already told me that Rami had been working with a set of top teeth for several months before so that was excellent to know that Rami was totally up for it so I knew every conversation I had with him um, that he would absorb any information or things I had to offer in, in helping him and, and I also knew that to use some for prosthetics I knew they had to be there somewhere uh, to help because although Rami it looks great. There were lots of things that could just take us that little bit closer. I mean, his nose is not quite the same as Freddie's. His eyes are a little larger and, and, and slightly wider apart. And and I, and I went straight to Mark Coulier, who is a prosthetic designer. Again, I've worked with over the years. Um, and we knew that we had to put all this together. So as soon as Rami came into the country, we, got, we asked if he could come in for test we, we had him cast and he just absorbed everything we had to offer um and he was a big part a big part of what he wanted i mean he's extremely precise even when i was sticking on the moustache i had made he was the one that would say up a millimeter to the left uh, you know i mean his input was mm. massive which 
for me is an utter delight because that's exactly how I like to work. Um, you know, little things that you hope people don't know what you've done. You, they know you've done something because they look different. Um, and and Rob yeah. is a hundred percent after it. Yeah, it's interesting too because when you when you think about things like makeup, hair, costuming, um, they de- they are definitely an aid to the actor and the transformation they're looking for. But at the same time, I would think with what you do, you have to take into account their, their freedom of expression and, and you know, what they, what they need to do movement wise. So is there, is there a concern to, to go as, as minimal as possible while still having it be effective? Well, I, I personally, that's how I like to work. I mean, I, I totally uh, love, you know, large makeup that work really well. I mean, there's some fantastic makeups around at the moment that are full face prosthetics, and they look amazing. I mean, last year was a prime example on, you know, The Darkest Hour, and, and what a brilliant job uh, the makeup team did there, and, and, and absolutely acknowledged. But I like to work in small bits. I, 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 I would much rather have smaller pieces around um, so that the actor, you know, can be allowed to own their character as well. Because for me, it's about finding the essence. It's not necessarily all looky-likey, you know what I mean? You can go, oh, that nose yeah. should have a tip on it, those ears should be bigger, or whatever it is. But it, for me, if I can find the essence, and then your actor then can put his mark on it, it's his version of Freddie. You know, it's, and, and, and I feel that Rami and I achieved that between us. You know, I went so far with it and, and then he was able to, to put his mark on it, um, which is, you know, that, you know, I love working closely like that with actors. The real characters that you've you've dealt with over your career, I mean, people like Freddie Mercury and his bandmates and Stephen Hawking, and uh, because there's a, kind of a flesh and blood example that you have to go by do you find that more restrictive um no i quite like the challenge of all of that i mean you know um you know working with with eddie redmayne on the theory of everything it 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 was again well documented and i i quite like that i quite like um having you know sort of timelines to work with i love finding final looks and then and working out that wonderful timeline in between to make it seamless. I love all those little bits and changes. I mean, I find all that quite exciting. Um, I mean, you know, quite often you're asked to completely make a character that, that's never appeared before. And, and then you, you can go everywhere. But then, you know, you, you would, you know, you would have to offer up so much more other things. I mean, I quite like having that restriction or I quite like having that detail to, to you know, to find. And, and it's not just, it's not just Freddie Mercury in this film because this movie has uh, a massive cast. I mean, especially when you take into account the, the extras that, that must've been needed to fill those concert scenes. Can you give me an idea of the, the scope of, of your work in this film? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, you know, um, an amazing team behind me, which I could not have done it without. I mean, we had nearly 7,000 extras. Uh, we, we had, I think it was something like, I don't know, 6,750. I think I, I, I looked it up recently to make sure I knew. Um, you know, there, was, there were 59 main cast members, you know, two of the cast aged over 40 years, uh, which was um, uh, uh, Freddie's parents. Um, we saw then, you know, sort of flashbacks into the 50s in Vanity Bar and, and then, you know, um, them early 70s. And, you know, so, so there, there was lots of lovely work there to do. Um, all the concerts that we recreated, I mean, I had a fantastic club supervisor called Renata Gilbert, who, um, you know, was, was, was getting all these supporting artists ready. They had to look like they were from... Budokan in Japan, Rio de Janeiro, uh, Madison Square Garden. It was really important that all these supporting artists, um, you know, showed because you know, uh, you know, the difference between a Japanese audience to a 
Brazilian audience to a, you know, an American audience. It was really great. And also you have to then put the period in, 1970s or 1980s. You know, it was, uh, there was a lot of work, a lot of work. And, and, and of course, lots of tattoo cover, <laughs> because everybody's tattooed now. <laughs> Um, and of course, they weren't so tattooed, and especially when we recreated Live Aid, and, and it was set in this, you know, it was summer, 1985, and everybody was out putting their hands in the air, and they all had short sleeves on, and all those tattoos had to be covered up, and there was a ton of work to be done. Um, so I did have an amazing team. I mean, wonderful suppliers as well. I mean, my wig maker, Alex Rouse, um, she made 14 weeks of me just in the top five cast. You know, so, mm. um, and, and they were, you know, a, a, another whatever. <laughs> From <laughs> Everybody had something. Everybody had something. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and, and and the look is so uh, specific to, to time period. And, and plus, I mean, rock and roll in the 70s and 80s, it, it was all about hair. And then, and then of course, Freddie Mercury, uh, I mean, he had such a distinctive look about him, distinctive features, especially the teeth. And I, I would think a particular challenge would be to do justice to, to, to what those really looked like, but at the same time not to distract. So it's the only thing that an audience w- would, yeah. would look at. Well, no, you're totally right because, you know, almost, you know, as I say, my, my first phone call was to Chris to do the teeth. And the thing is, is what I said to my very first test, I said, um, Chris, give me three sets of teeth. I want you to scale uh, Freddie Mercury's teeth. I want an actual scale pair of them. Then do me a medium set and then do me a small set. And we put Freddie's teeth in Mahomey and they were massive. I mean, they, you couldn't, they didn't work. I mean, you could <laughs> tell that the scale wasn't going to work, even though that's exactly the teeth size he had. So they couldn't be distracting, you know. Um, so, so we did many, many um, tests. I mean, uh, and overall, I think 20 sets of teeth just for Rami. I mean, a lot of those were like backup teeth as well. But we would change a millimetre. We'd go up a millimetre, back a millimetre. You know, set of teeth without the molars, with the molars. You know, it all, and we did eventually find, because it would have been wrong not to have done them. And they had to be pretty prominent, you know, but not distracting, you're absolutely right. So I guess I was most nervous about them. Um, I mean, at one point, I even thought, you know, we would have different teeth for when it was Freddie with a moustache, because the moustache softened uh, Rami's top lip. And then when you see, you know, Freddie in the early years when he had no facial hair, I thought, oh, maybe we should have a softer pair. But we didn't in the end, actually. We could use the same, the same shape, you know, the same set. set. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, that that was a big deal. <laughs> but everybody was in on it. Yeah. You know, we all had our opinion, um, and no more so than Rami, who absolutely knew what was going to work for him. Now, you mentioned earlier about the the collaboration between yourself and the production designer and the costume designer. Uh, give me an example of how uh, that relationship, the, the three of you, complement one another is. Like, why is it important for you to know the particulars of the costume an actor is wearing in any given scene? Well, I mean, always. I mean, this is sort of what happens in all films, but particularly Belle or, or Julia, the costume designer. So he's already getting his, you know, his color palette together, as discussed with, you know, directors and producers, and and so, you know, you know, then the costume designer would come in and he would have to make sure that his colours complemented. Uh, and then I come in after that and I have to make sure that, that, you know, A, everything's correct. I mean, when we were doing all the concerts, you know, the, the hair had to match the outfit. And, and we had enough references to make sure that happened. But, you know, they, they for example, um, uh, you know, Queen would uh, sing their songs um, all through their concert, all through the decades. So even though they may have written a song, in, say, 1975, they would still be playing it and reenacting it in, in maybe 81. But we had to make sure that the costume and the hair matched and that we were, you know, that the if we were saying within the film that this is the first time they'd sung the song, then it would be the, the 70s look rather than the 80s look. Or are we saying that's just part of a whole concert? You know, so 
we had to speak really closely together to make sure hair and costume match. Um, you know, and and of course you do that anyway in your production meetings, and, and you know, and your questions to, to, to you know with each other. Yeah. We you know we all bounce off each other. Did you have a lot of interaction with the surviving members of the band? Oh, um, well, I did. I did meet Brian, and, and they were lovely and, and totally open for any questions. Um, I, I know because Julian had been on board slightly earlier than me that he had gone to um, Brian's house, and, and Brian had lent him quite a lot of his clothes. I, I think he keeps everything, and he has them all there. So I know Gwilym, who plays. Brian May, uh, Blum Lee. Um, he was so delighted when he would say, and this top is Brian's, and he wore that in, you know. But no, they were, they were great. I, I did meet them on a few occasions, and, and they were extremely generous with their, with their information. Yeah, I can't imagine what that dynamic is like, to, to, to look up there and, and see yourself 40 years ago. <laughs> that, that must be something mm, else. I know. Well, do you know what? I, I can only think, um, it, it, Brian definitely visited the set slightly more than Roger, and I can only think that, that he was delighted because there was always a massive grin on his face. And when we did like the whole, we did a whole week of the concerts where, you know, we, we, we shot one concert a day, you know, like the Budokan concert, and the, you know, the Madison Square Gardens, and, and, um, and Brian was around and he just had the biggest smile. Um, uh, mm. uh, and I think extremely emotional for, for him and, and his wife Anita when they were watching it up there. It must it must have been uh, amazing to see because the whole band, you know, Rami and, and Gwilym and Joe and Ben, they were just phenomenal. You know, the, 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 the research they've done themselves into each of their characters, um, just excellent. Yeah, and as a, as a, as the makeup designer, is there usually uh, an aha moment or a moment when you know that you've you've got it and the transformation is complete? Uh, complete, or is it all just process? Well, it, it's always many tests, and in fact, you know, uh, we knew we could get Rami looking like. Freddie at Live Aid because there are such strong things there, you know, like the moustache and the short hair. Um, but really, you know, we kept refining the prosthetic nose because, I, you know, that was really important. And when we did refine it, I mean, I didn't know until the day. It wasn't until they were all together. We, we did a very successful camera test um, before where, you know, we did the four band members, including... Um, uh, lovely Lucy, Lucy Boyd, who plays uh, Mary Austin. And everybody was really pleased with it all. But it's not until you're there, it wasn't until day one when we, uh, when it just became, you know, you, you just got goosebumps and you thought, oh, my God, this is this is going to look great. So what uh, what's next for you? You did Wonder Woman, the, the upcoming Wonder Woman, didn't you? Yeah, well, we've literally got a couple of weeks left. We're just about to finish. Um, uh, and it's been great doing that. Um, you know, yeah, I've been on that one. So for me at the moment, it will be uh, Christmas and then a couple of months off, I think. I mean, there's a couple of things probably in the way, but, uh, you know, that are exciting. So, so um, uh, and again, quite no cuppy. So looking forward to those possibly. But I'm definitely looking forward to Christmas in a couple of months off. <laughs> but but <you> what's know, <laughs> the latest four things? Well, you deserve a break, and uh, you, you've been working on some, some massive, uh, massive scale movies lately, and, and you've been doing such such terrific work. And I really appreciate you giving me time today to talk about it. Oh, well, no, it's my pleasure, and um, and you know, I'm I'm very lucky. I enjoy my job as, as much now, if not more, uh, than when I started. So, you know, I'm a very lucky person. <laughs> 